Good morning, church. Can you please stand and worship with us together this morning. <clears throat> we got the subs up here leading this morning. Hope you don't mind. Our, our worship leaders are not here this week, so we'll need you to sing extra loud today to help us out. Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you for this time we have together this morning to lift up our hearts and our souls and our minds to worship you. We thank you that your spirit is among us and that you're here to meet us wherever we are this morning. You're here to meet us in our need, Lord, and in our praise to you, Father. And we just thank you for this in the, in the name of your holy and risen son, Jesus. Amen. Psalms this morning. This is the hymn book of the Bible, a worship set list that we get out of the Bible every, every week. So we're going to read from Psalm 16 this morning. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have nothing good beside you. Lord, you are my portion, my cup of blessing. You hold my future. 
the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. We thank you, Father, that for all that awaits us in eternity, Lord, that we have that hope and, and that joy in you. But right now, we're here on this earth, Father. And we know that you're here with us as well. You're here to fight for us as we commit our lives to you each day. We thank you for that in, in Jesus' name. Thank you. 
continuing with the Psalms. Psalm 16, I will bless the Lord who counsels me. Even at night when my thoughts trouble me, I will always let the Lord guide me because he, at my right, he is at my right hand and I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My body also rests securely for you will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. You reveal the path of life to me, and your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. And we thank you, Lord, for this, your sovereignty over this Lord, over this world. We thank you for this Easter season. We celebrate the resurrection of your son, Jesus. Even in this psalm, we hear your prophecy about him. And the psalm was written a thousand years before his, his birth. And we thank you for your sovereignty over all that. We just pray for our week coming up, Father, and for the message we're about to hear, Lord, this morning.
God, we're just, we're just so thankful that we get to be here with you today, that our, let our one desire today be to, to know your love and to be here, worship, learn about your Bible, and just spend time with your family here today. God, I pray that as we are, we're done with this part of worship now that we're going into while the kids are learning downstairs, while we're learning upstairs, that we just open our minds and listen to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, River Church. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Josh Miner. I run the River Kids group downstairs. <laughs> I love that noise. It's awesome. Um, yeah, so I help run the River Kids group downstairs with my wife, Laura. Um, we, we've got, for those of you who don't know, we have three classrooms downstairs. Um, we have our, our toddlers group, which is like a nursery toddlers type setup. We've got our kids one and then our kids two. Um, and they're all different classrooms based off of basically how old the kids are and uh, meeting them where they're at. Um, so for announcements, um, this Tuesday, we've got starting up again the Transformation Tuesdays. Uh, it's kind of like a small group setup. Um, we've got after church today, we have a River Youth Reset for all you parents that have probably got an email. Um, that is directly after church, right? Yeah, directly after church. And then we also have our River Kids meeting directly after church. Um, so basically one of the things that I wanted to mention was that um, with the, the wonderful kids crying out there, it's great. Um, but it's, it's great to, to be in a position where you can talk with kids and teach them and honestly learn from them. Um, so I wanted to encourage the church in general to, uh, to pray about if God wants you serving, uh, serving the kids downstairs. Um, and uh, just encourage you to pray about it and that if that's where God wants you to be, uh, come up, talk with myself, my wife, just basically any of the teachers you see or any, basically anyone here can probably point you in the right direction, honestly. So feel free to uh, come chat with us. So if uh, you join me in praying for the preaching today. God, I just, I thank you for everything you've done here at River Church. I thank you that, uh, I thank you for Josh. I thank you that you work through him every week. Um, and I pray that you open our minds to what you want to tell us today. And uh, I pray for the kids downstairs that you'll open their minds and let us meet the kids where they're at. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Josh. One of the most comforting verses that we have in the New Testament come directly from the words of Jesus. And when I begin to say these words, many of you have probably committed them to memory. But many of you are probably familiar with where the verse is going. Uh, and, and for those of you who have never heard this verse before, you're kind of like, and that's what Christianity is all about. Like, I am so down with this idea from Jesus. And the words are this, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. I'm preaching the end of the sermon right now, is what I'm doing. This is where this sermon is going. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest for your souls. Come and learn from me, because I am humble and meek, and, and take up your sword, no, <laughs> take up your yoke and learn of me. And so, this, this provides so much comfort. It provides so much guidance. It, we, we feel like we're looking right into the heart of Jesus when we hear these words of comfort that he shares with us. They're found in Matthew chapter 11. This morning, what I want to do is I want to go back there at the end of Matthew chapter 11. What I want to do is take you back to the beginning of Matthew chapter 11 because I don't know that we have a proper appreciation for the true power and depth of this invitation from Jesus to come to him and to receive peace 
for our souls. In fact, it's not possible to have a full appreciation of the power and the depth of this invitation from Jesus unless we have a greater appreciation for what the the preceding context is. And so this morning we'll be in Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 uh, through the end of the chapter. It's quite a long passage, and so there are parts of it that I'm kind of just going to narrate through, and we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on. But I want us to have a greater appreciation for the fact that Jesus gives this invitation to come to him in the context of his most profound teaching regarding the kingdom of God that he offers in the New Testament. It's the longest teaching that he offers regarding the kingdom of God in the New Testament. And it is some of the most confusing verses found in all of the New Testament. It's the longest, it's the deepest, it's the most, uh, uh, he says so many things, and also it's super hard to understand what he's talking about. But if we don't have an idea of this kingdom concept, then we don't have a true appreciation, at least not the one that he intended for his audience, when we have this invitation at the end of Matthew chapter 11 to come to him. And so I want to share with you, Matthew chapter 11 begins with this. His cousin, John the Baptist, who was the first one who actually preceded Jesus with the message of the kingdom, and we know that the kingdom, the definition of the kingdom is the place where God's law is is obeyed, the place where his will is known, where people are following him by faith. From the second that John the Baptist began to preach the kingdom, and then Jesus started to preach the kingdom, Jesus had to try and help people grow in their knowledge of what the kingdom actually meant. Because when John the Baptist started to preach, uh, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, they were thinking of a place and and a time. They were thinking probably Jerusalem, probably sooner rather than later. And when Jesus begins preaching the kingdom, he's talking more about a person, that he is the representation of the kingdom, that he is the closest to the kingdom that any of us will ever come, and, a, and, and that it's not so much, of the, the kingdom preaching from Jesus in the first century is not so much about Jerusalem, a time and a place. That's what his disciples thought. That's what John the Baptist thought. Jesus was teaching about the kingdom and that it's more about a person and that the kingdom of God can be found inside of a person and that when we believe the teachings of Jesus and accept Jesus by faith, It's not that we go to a certain place or a location or a time, it's that eternity comes to us, that the kingdom of God is found first and foremost in Jesus Christ, but by faith, it's also found in Christians. And and so Jesus is trying to, the the confusion over Jesus' teaching regarding the kingdom of God revolved around this big idea that everyone else who's talking about the kingdom of God was referring to Jerusalem and kicking out the Romans, whereas Jesus was talking about himself and having eternity come to reside with a person. John has been arrested, and so uh, you can read that story in a number of the Gospels. Bottom line is he got himself in trouble with the king, and uh, the king didn't like being called out for his sin, and so the king threw John the Baptist in prison. And John the Baptist sends a messenger, and you can find it in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. He sends some of his disciples to Jesus, and he basically says, will you come and storm the castle for me? We know that you're preaching about the kingdom of God. When you establish your kingdom, will you storm my actual castle and set me free? Will your kingdom mean freedom for me? Will your kingdom mean restoration of my life? Will you come and literally deliver me from my captives? John is basically saying to his cousin Jesus, I need someone to storm the castle. You're preaching about the kingdom of God. When your kingdom is established, will you come and storm my actual castle where I am a captive in a dungeon? Here's here's how John actually says it. When Jesus had finished giving orders to his 12 disciples, he moved on from there to teach and preach in their towns. When John heard in prison that the, what the Messiah was doing, he sent a message by his disciples and asked him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Will you come and free me from my captivity? Will you, when you usher in the kingdom, are you the one to come, kingdom come? Is it your will that I would be delivered? And so this morning, the first big idea is when we think about faith, 
when we think about making decisions of faith, when we find ourselves in church, when we find ourselves at sunrise services, when we're serving in ministry, when we're doing the things that we know represent a life of faith, we are asking ourselves, is this going to free me from my captivity? I need someone to storm the castle of my captivity, and so I'm going to do the right things at the right time in hopes that I receive the right reward, that when the kingdom is established, that I am free. And so, like John the Baptist this morning, uh, just in the short time we've already had here today, you may have heard of someone who needs to see God move in their life. And while we might use different words, we're all kind of asking the same thing. Would you come and set me free? Would you deliver me from this thing that is kind of holding me captive? Will you come and storm the castle where I am locked inside? Will you set me free? I need Jesus, and I'm trying by faith, to the best of my ability, to be in the right place at the right time, doing the right things, so that I can experience freedom. And so it's not a big stretch to feel connected with John the Baptist, who's actually locked up. I need someone to storm the castle. You're the king. Are you the one who is to come, or should I set my hopes on being freed on somebody else? Jesus replies, go and report to John what you hear and see. And now he's quoting from the book of Isaiah. The blind see, the lame walk. Those with skin diseases are healed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised. And the poor are told the good news. And then he says this, and if anyone is not offended because of me, he is blessed. Basically, what Jesus is replying to John is saying, you have a set of preconceptions about what I am going to do for you when the kingdom comes. Are you going to hold to those preconceptions or will you hold to me? Because here's what I'm doing. I'm setting captives free. I'm healing the blind. I'm healing the sick. I have a, a, a mission of mercy. Will you, and and I know that that's not what you think I should be doing right now. I understand that you are disappointed in me right now, that what you need is is a caped crusader to come and storm the castle. What I'm telling you is that in accordance with God's eternal plan, I'm here on a mission of mercy and justice to the weakest of the weak and the poorest of the poor and the lame and the blind, and blessed are you if you can let go of your preconceived notion of what I'm gonna do for you and actually look at me and, and, and try to understand what I'm doing and why. Your preconceptions, will you hold on to them or me? This is the message that his cousin gets from his disciples. You think I'm going to come and storm the castle. John, I, I, I'm not coming to storm the castle. It's not the castle I'm laying siege against. Are you, well, can you let go of your preconceived notions of what I'm supposed to be doing for you and actually look at me and look at me and what I'm doing and what the kingdom looks like from my perspective? That's a tough one, right? Because John understandably has felt needs that he wants Jesus to, to do for him, to solve for him. We're kind of resonating with John the Baptist today, right? <laughs> now, we know he's a little, he rolls a little hard for us. He, he wears, you know, hand-woven garments and he eats bugs. And he, 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 he's the last of the Old Testament prophets and the first of the New Testament martyrs. And Jesus goes on to tell us more about John the Baptist. But maybe when we realize the position of need that John the Baptist is in right now, we begin to feel closer to John the Baptist than we've ever felt before. Jesus, would you come and store my castle? And Jesus' reply is, is it okay if I take care of other things? Is it okay if I don't meet your objectives? Is it okay if I don't meet your preconceived notions? Because here's the thing, you're appealing to me as a king who has authority Do I have the authority to disappoint you, and will you still follow me? This is the message that he sends back to his cousin. It's a powerful reminder that Jesus as the king has his own agenda, and it may or may not be ours. It certainly wasn't John the Baptist. So the messengers go back to deliver the news to John, basically because I'm not coming. Not in that way. That's not the castle I'm coming to siege. That's not the castle I'm going to break you out of. As these men went away, continuing in verse 7, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. (laughs) Because here's the deal. Jesus basically tells his cousin no. He tells his family no. And in Eastern Eastern cultures, it's all about family honor. 
Uh, It's not so much about personal responsibility and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and getting the best education that you can and making your mama proud. It's more about what is the family needs and how can I serve the family? And this was a request from a family member and Jesus said, no, not really. I'm, I'm going to, you know, you're going to have to get over your preconceived notions of what you want me to do for you because I'm, 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 on, a, I'm on a different path right now. Here's, here's the path in Scripture. This is the path I'm on. And it has nothing to do with, with conquering Herod right now. Jesus knows that this makes him look weak in this Eastern culture. Maybe, maybe Jesus is saying, no, I will not set you free from Herod's castle because I, I don't have the power or the resources. I'm all talk. No go. And, 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 and so Jesus realizes that by sharing the truth with, in public that he just opened himself up. Like, well, maybe that's a very convenient answer, Jesus, that you're too busy doing other things, but the reality of it is you don't have the power, the authority to go free your cousin. And so that was your way of saying no. You're, you're coming from a position of weakness. And, and, and this is reflecting on his family. Maybe John's message isn't worth rescuing either. Maybe John's message was weak. Maybe the whole family has nothing to contribute to this conversation of a kingdom. It's all just talk and no walk. So Jesus addresses this. As these men went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. Basically, does the kingdom have power and authority, or is it just a bunch of hot air? What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? He's referring to his cousin who always taught and preached in wilderness places. What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? And his listeners know, no, John was known for wearing hair shirts. John was known for rough-hewn clothing. Look, those who wear soft clothes are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and far more than a prophet. This is the one it is written about. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. So Jesus is making the claim that don't, don't, don't for a second think that the kingdom is all talk and no walk. You just have to understand that the agenda that we're pursuing is not matching up with the public's agenda right now. And, and, and I can prove it from your own time and interest. Why did you listen to John if it was a message of weakness? Why did you go out into the desert place to listen to a guy who was all talk and no walk? No, the reason you went out into the wilderness to listen to John, the reason you got over his funny appearance and his coarse mannerisms and style is the fact that he preached the kingdom with power. And it was a message of repentance. And people's lives are being changed. And Jesus is going to refer to that here in just a few verses. And so don't don't think that John is in jail because he's weak. He's in prison because he was preaching against sin boldly and with strength and with conviction There should be more people in jail because everybody knew that Herod was evil. John was the only one that had the strength and the courage to actually say the truth out loud and to confront the king with his sin. You didn't go out into the wilderness to hear a wishy-washy guy. You went out because you saw strength and power and conviction. And let me tell you, you have no idea how much strength and power and conviction you were seeing out there. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets and the first of the New Testament martyrs. Look, and from Scripture, he is preceding the coming of the kingdom in power. And so Jesus begins to try and focus the attention back on himself as an authoritative messenger, representative of the kingdom of God. And he quotes Scripture again. Look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, referring to his cousin. He will prepare your way, and in your Bible it's probably capitalized, your. He'll prepare the way of the Lord. I assure you among those... Born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. Don't, don't think that John the Baptist is weak. Don't, don't mistake that I am weak. He had a message of kingdom power and authority, and the message was that I am coming, and here I am. This is a message of kingdom power and authority, but it's not about storming castles. It's far deeper than that. And then, he's, and then he begins to preach about the kingdom directly. But oh my goodness, it's so mysterious. So let's jump into it. How are we doing so far? Hang on to this thought. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. It's all a kingdom, kingdom context. We're going to get there. You're doing good. You're doing, I don't see any glazed eyes. You know I can see your eyes, right? 
You know that's why I sit on this little kitty stool here, it's so I can look you in the eye, and I know if you're... Okay, all right, good, you're doing good. Uh, he continues, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So John the Baptist is great, John the Baptist is strong, However, for those who have actually attained the kingdom of heaven, and we're going to take a look at what that means, those are actually even greater and stronger. From the days until John the Baptist until now, the days of the last Old Testament prophet until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence. One of the most mysterious verses, thoughts, ideas, words in the entire New Testament if not the Bible. How is it possible for God's eternal reign to suffer violence? And the violent have been seizing it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. Anyone who has ears to hear should listen. Let's go back to the heart of the mystery The kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence, and the violent have been seizing it by force. This passage also also appears in Luke. There are two main ways most commentators will approach this verse. I agree with them both, and I'm going to show you why. And then we're going to pull out a principle from these main uh, ideas about what on earth is Jesus talking about here. His cousin is in prison, okay, in an actual cell, in a castle. He sends a request, will you set me free? Are you the one to come? And by the way, when you come, spring these gates open for me. Or should I set my hopes on someone else? And, 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 and Jesus says, here's what I'm about. I hope you're okay with my agenda. Blessed are you if you're okay with losing your preconceived notions of what you want Jesus to do for you, but you actually accept who Jesus is. Blessed are you if you can accept me for who I am. And here's what I'm about. The messengers go away, and now he's preaching to the crowds, and he has this incredibly mysterious statement. So let's just take it from its face value. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence. In this context, in Matthew chapter 11, is anyone suffering violence? Is anyone actually being held captive? Is anyone actually being abused and oppressed and having the will of violent people done to them that they don't want? Yeah, it even says it in the context, since the days of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is actually suffering violence at the hands of violent people. He's in a violent place that he doesn't want to be. And so there is one sense of this verse where there is resistance to the advance of the kingdom. It's not a happy ending for John. Does anyone remember what happens to John the Baptist while he's in prison? Does he escape? No. What does he lose? He loses his actual head. Now, he became, uh, at his death, of course, he then entered the kingdom of God, and we know that as good as he was in life, that once he actually entered the eternal state and kingdom, that he was actually even, so he's okay, but it's not a happy ending for John the Baptist. In the context, there is someone suffering violence at the hands of violent people. The kingdom, John was the first one to come and say, repent, for the kingdom of God is closer than you could possibly think. Change your ways. And for this, he is locked up in jail and ultimately martyred. The last of the Old Testament prophets, the first of the New Testament martyrs. One way to interpret this verse on its face value is that there's pushback against the advance of the kingdom of God in the life of John the Baptist. That is, a, that is a reality. And blessed are you if you don't stumble over the fact that not everything is peaches and roses and rainbows and unicorns in the advancement of the kingdom of God. You think about it, especially when you read the Gospel of Luke, was there ever a history in, in the world where there was more angelic activity and prophetic pronouncements than there was preceding the birth of John the Baptist? The answer is no. There was, more in, there was a greater advancement of the kingdom of God in the first century A.D. than we've ever seen since the creation of the world. Yet there is also a very real resistance to it where there are people with evil and violent agendas and, and they are seeking to resist, if not uh, take over or impede the work of God on the planet and definitely in our lives. I don't think it's a long stretch for us to be like, 
okay, yep, I can see that. I can see that. I'm having conversations with people now. One, because it's on my heart and has been for a year or so. Two, because people are actually calling me and asking me about this. Um, and so I'm beginning to talk with pastors throughout the region, just like I did 10 years ago before planting River Church. 10 years ago, the conversation was, you have a church, I don't. I'd like to hear your story. Because regardless of whether or not I agree with your theology and your practice and what your church looks like, God is calling me to start a church, and you've got one, so you must know things that I don't know. And, and what, what, what wonderful conversations. It, it lead to things that I flippantly referred to a couple of weeks ago. It sounds like a joke. An open and affirming lady pastor, you know, uh, a Catholic priest, and a swamp yank and a Polak walk in the Panera Bread to plan an Easter service, and you were there. It was beautiful. <laughs> like, praise the Lord for this group of people. Where did that come from? It came from me 10 years ago saying, you have a church and I don't. Can we talk about it? And we prayed together, and we became friends. And we still remain very, very different, but we also really enjoy each other's company. That was 10 years ago. I'm going around now asking anyone within a 10, 15, 20-mile radius who is a church who has a Christian school or a daycare or a nursery. Two reasons. One, we share our stuff here at River Church, and the Lord has given us a beautiful stuff, right? Josh and his team right now are using 6,000 square feet of five of the nicest classrooms in Griswold for gospel programming. Guess how many kids are in those classrooms tomorrow morning at this time? Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning. Zero children in those classrooms. We, we can do better at sharing our stuff. We got stuff, nice stuff, lots of stuff. We should do a better job sharing it. So I'm talking to pastors who have, it, it's not a popsicle stand, it's not a coffee shop, it's not a flea market, it's classrooms designed for children. What do you think we should shove in those classrooms? Children. children. <laughs> With teachers. Amen. With teachers. <laughs> so when Josh says pray about getting involved with kids, you better be praying about getting involved with kids because we share our stuff. And so that's one of the reasons I'm having conversations with pastors 10 years later, you know, like, hey, you have a school and I don't. What does that look like? The other reason is I love the public school system. Every single minute of my education was in a public school. My wife works in a public school system. Every single minute of her education was in public schools. We think they're a tremendous place to receive an education. A school housed this church for eight years. Can I get an amen? And they charged us no money for that. Zero dollars for eight years. Every time we met for worship, the custodian unlocked the school for us with the Board of Ed's permission. So, like, we're huge fans. But they're teaching stuff that's just straight up wrong. And some of us are okay with handling that at home because the single greatest influence in the life of a child is not his teacher, it's his mommy and his daddy. And I'm telling you right now, the things that you pray and teach and sing over your children have way more influence and weight on your child than anything they learn in health class. But what they're learning in health class is evil. Okay? This is, this is real talk right now. So for the second reason I'm talking about what, what does it look like is because there is pushback against the kingdom of God in the life of your child. And some of our families need help. Some families are okay with, with, with sending their kids to the public school and, and, and they're okay with that vibe. My family was that family. But I get it that we're, we're, not every family is like that. And I'm also the first to say that it's different even now than it was when my boys were in school. Things are changing quick, and I don't want to be insensitive to that. Just because my boys did fine doesn't mean yours will. Mine are adults now. Yours are not. And, and, and so there's, they're, they're, the kingdom of God is suffering violence, and violent people with violent agendas are doing violent things to the hearts and souls and minds of our young people. And we have stuff, lots of stuff, that's being well utilized this morning, but it could be utilized better throughout the week. So I'm having conversations. Because I see this. I see it. The, 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 from the days until John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence, and the violent have been seizing it by force. That's one way to interpret that verse. And that's one conversation we're having out of that reality. There's another way of taking a look at this verse. 
Many scholars say that because so many people were responding to the preaching of the gospel that John gave and the preaching of the gospel that Jesus, how many times do we see in the New Testament where Jesus, minding his own business, trying to have a quiet cup of tea, ends up in a boat offshore because the crowds pressed him off of the land? How many times do we see people running out into the wilderness to go listen to a guy in a hair shirt who had a bug for breakfast preach about the kingdom of God? The hundreds, if not thousands of people were entering the kingdom of God through the preaching of John the Baptist and Jesus. And these were not the nice people. They were the uneducated people. They were the, 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 the people who were not at the height of society with resources. They were at the bottom of society with no resources. Do you understand the Sermon on the Mount was a good news to those who were poor in every sense of the term? Not just spiritually poor, but actually poor. So another way of properly interpreting this verse is that look at the kind of people who are entering into the kingdom of God. They're not the ones that you would think would be entering into the kingdom of God. They're not nice people. And they're like boldly believing in John the Baptist and Jesus, and they're actually presenting themselves as men and women of faith, but they're, the, they're not even welcome in the temple. They're furthest, the, in the eyes of the culture, they were the furthest from God, yet they were acting like they were actually in God's presence. People were taking a hold of the good news of the gospel violently and clinging to it for dear life, and actually repenting of their sins. Last week we took a look, or the week before, I can't remember, it was Zacchaeus, who actually repented of his sins and paid back everybody and gave gifts of generosity. Like, the, the wrong people, mean people, nasty people, ugly people, smelly people, were, were, were encroaching upon and invading and presuming upon the kingdom of God and acting like it and truly changing their lives. And from the religious point of view, it looked violent that people are actually trespassing into the kingdom of God. So there's this other way of interpreting this verse, that it's not so much about evil resisting the advance of the kingdom, it's about the evil invading the kingdom and being accepted (laughs) because they've repented. I I wanna show you that it's okay, and you can read one book and it says one thing, you can read another book and you can say another, if we were to take a poll of what your translations say about this, re- this verse, you're going to find a number of different ways that scholarly teams have translated these verses. Here's why the ambiguity is okay and why both things are true. I want to show you something that you can't see because it's written in English. But when you look in the Greek, Jesus is preaching about this very serious kingdom concept with a little bit of a grin on his face. He's having a little bit of fun with this. Did you go out into the wilderness to see a swaying reed and someone dressed in kingly clothes? Okay, he's having a little bit of fun with his listeners. Listen to what the, and I'm not gonna pretend to be able to pronounce this correctly in the Greek, but in the Greek, you need to know that he's having some fun with the letter B. And so there's a context of humor. There's a context of levity. There is intentional ambiguity in this verse so that you can take a look at it as the kingdom of God being resisted, and you can also take a look at it as those who are resisting are advancing forcefully into the kingdom of God. Listen to this. The word for kingdom, is, or, or the word for John the Baptist, you're gonna be familiar with this, is baptisto. So John, the baptisto, he's introducing the thought, and he's talking about the kingdom, which is the Greek word basileia, from which we, you can hear basilica. Okay, think basilica. So the baptisto, and then he starts talking about the basilica, and the word for uh, has been suffering violence is baiazatai. Baiazatai. And those who are seizing it by force are baistas. So the baptisto, talking about the basilica, it's under attack from Baisatai by the Baitistas. The context is, did you go out to listen to a nice guy dressed in pillowy soft clothes? There's, a, there's an undercurrent of irony and humor in this teaching. There's supposed to be some ambiguity, and the key is in the humor that he precedes it, and he's having fun with the letter B, and you just don't see it in English. 
And, and, and so he's, there's this context of some of you might be taking it this way, some of you might be taking it that way. It's okay. What I'm, what I'm telling you, though, and this is the big idea that I want to share with you, and this might be the main point of the sermon for you, and then I want to make the actual main point and wrap up our time. This is what Jesus is teaching about the kingdom in castles and violent people with violent agendas. Maybe they're forcing their way into the kingdom. Maybe the evil kingdom is forcing its way against the advance of the kingdom. Here's what Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has no defense system or mechanism for repentance. Let me say that again. The kingdom of God is perfectly defenseless against repentance. It doesn't matter what cage you find yourself in this morning. The kingdom of God is open to those who are repentant. The walls come down. You can walk around like you own the place. There is no heavenly defense mechanism for repentance. This is the kingdom principle that he's trying to I'm not, I'm not so worried about springing you, John, from your castle. I'm not laying siege against Herod. What I'm laying siege against is the kingdom of the forces of evil, and I'm making it possible for the repentant to have free admittance into the kingdom of God. There are no defense mechanisms against repentance. And here's the other thing. There's no way into the kingdom of heaven without repentance. That's how it works. It is perfectly fortified against everything, except, is perfectly fortified against works, is perfectly fortified against money, is perfectly fortified against our best thoughts, ideas, and efforts, is perfectly fortified against what we know about science, is perfectly, for, heaven is perfectly fortified in every single way. It is wide open, no defense mechanism for those who are repentant. The kingdom of heaven has no defense for those who repent. And by the way, that's the only way in. Continuing in the text, I'm going to skip over some stuff because then Jesus, again, having some fun with his people, he goes, the problem is that you're unresponsive. You're like children in the marketplace. Some of you are playing a game where you're pretending to have a funeral and you're singing mopey songs about sad days and you're like pretending you're all Eeyore. That's an anachronism, but you get it. And some of you are pretending that you're a wedding and you're singing happy songs and you're supposed to be dancing, but all you are like children in the marketplace, you won't waltz to the dirge when the dirge is being played, but you won't skip to the marriage tune when the mar like you're just not responsive. That's the problem. So he's continuing in this vein of teaching very serious stuff, but he's also kind of having some fun with it by referring to children playing. And he goes on to have some very spicy things to say. And then we come down to the end of the passage. Uh, he addresses the fact that some of you think I'm a glutton and some of you think that John is too ascetic and so he, he, get over it. And here's where he wraps up. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Do you remember, he finally gets around to answering his cousin's question directly. Now his cousin's not there. He's just teaching to the people, but the people heard all the conversation. Do you remember what John said? Are you the one to come? Are you the one to come? Jesus replies, <laughs> come to me. Come to me. John, in your prison, in your cage, locked up. He's not talking about coming to him physically. He's not talking about knocking down actual castle walls and picking up swords. He's saying, will you trip over your preconceived notions of what you want me to do for you or will you actually embrace what's happening right now? Because there is no defense for repentance. There is no defense for signing on with God's agenda. In fact, it's the only way. All of you and his, and his followers are waiting. They're, they, they're, they're so interested in Jesus saying this, all of you, take up your swords and follow me. 
and I will give you positions of power and influence, and we will whoop up on the Romans. Like they so much wanted to, when he, when he begins this statement, all of you pick up your, they're like, swords, yes, it's in the trunk, I brought it. <laughs> it's here, I've been practicing. I am so, yes, he's finally gonna say it. Come and pick up your, what? Pick up, pick up, pick up your yoke. And learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart. Blessed are you if you don't trip over me right now. Blessed are you if you let go of your preconceived notions. I'm, not t- I'm talking about a victory that will take your breath away. John, I ain't coming. Come to me. Because you are weary. You are burdened. You are locked up. You are scared. You are frightened. You feel immobile. You've never been more mobile in your life. You've never been closer to me in your life. I'm not coming to you. I'm the king. You come to me. And there's nothing that will prevent you if you're repentant. And I will give you a yoke and a light burden, and we will accomplish great things together. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It is the most convoluted, it is the longest, it is the hardest to understand teaching referring to the kingdom of heaven. The end of the passage brings us to a great promise of peace and comfort, but the path is not one that we would have anticipated. It's a path of letting go of what we think we want God to do for us and actually letting God do for us. Blessed are we if we do not trip over the teaching of Jesus, understanding that heaven has no defense system for those of us who are repentant and who are willing to not summon Jesus, but to come to him in the midst of whatever you feel is holding you back right now. What what this passage is saying is that you've never been closer. You feel distant, you feel guilty, you feel tired, you feel weak, you feel impressed upon You feel like things are not going the way you want them to go. You've never felt further, and he says, come. You've never been closer. Come. In your captivity, come. That is a far more powerful message than the one that we thought. It's a far more powerful invitation than the one that we thought. This is not a platitude. It is a command from the king. He is well aware that his cousin is in jail and he just said, come. He's perfectly aware of that. He's well aware of what you're afraid of. He's well aware of what you're scared of. He's well aware of what you're guilty of. And Jesus says, come. Leave the sword in the car. We'll whack people some other day. You'll know when it's time because he'll have a sword on that day. For now, it's a yoke. And the burden that he wants us to carry is will you share that message with others who feel the way you used to feel? That's why it's called the good news, people. That's why it's called the gospel. Right where you're at, will you come? At this point in our service, we're going to move into a time of communion. I'm going to ask Todd to come and officiate for us this morning. You might be wondering, is communion for you? The answer is, have you come? Have you responded to Jesus by faith? And if you've set down your preconceived notions about what you think you want God to do for you, and you've accepted God's agenda for your life, and it sounds like this, Heavenly Father, from a place of captivity, confusion, guilt, shame, whatever, I've never been closer and I'm coming because you are a man of peace and you've promised me peace and I will come. If you've made that memory, then you should remember it in communion. If you've not made that memory, then would you make that memory? Forgive me, I repent. Understanding that when we repent, you just entered the kingdom of heaven. All its defenses are down. Everything else that you've tried has failed. Now you just found the thing that works. And would you join us? So Todd, come on up, thank you, sir. So Verlin's going around with the elements if you don't have them already. Uh, Great sermon to lead into this special time. 
And I'll, I'll read a quick snippet from my study Bible. The Lord's Supper offers a uniquely powerful time of spiritual intimacy with the Lord in the same way that physical intimacy exists between, in a marriage between a husband and a wife. This is a time, a special time of sharing with Christ beyond the normal relationship that we have with him, enabling us to access heaven at a deeper level. See, communion is designed to demonstrate the unity of the church at a common meal with the Savior. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, he prepares us. He says, you know, self-examine yourself so that whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. So at this moment, just think about where you are. We, we, we're all sinners. There's no one that comes before Jesus without sin. Examine ourselves where we're at at this moment. And like Josh said, if you don't, if you don't know the Lord, Ask him into your heart and prepare yourself for this special time together. In 1 Corinthians, same chapter 11, verse 23, he says, For I have received from the Lord what I also pass unto you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which will be given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's have communion.
Heavenly Father, you are our King. Oh, how we desperately need you to come. If we were to make a list of the things that we need to be freed from, Lord, we would run out of time this afternoon. And your call to us is to come to you, especially those of us who feel heavy laden and burdened, and to take your yoke upon us and to learn from you because you are gentle and you are humble. And we'll leave our agendas and our swords behind. Boldly, even violently pressing into the kingdom of heaven through the power of repentance because we find that when we are repentant, we are allowed access to a deeper relationship with you and you teach us things and you empower us for your service in ways that we could have never anticipated or seen. And so Lord, we we say yes, we say please, we say thank you. And we ask that you would empower us for your service even this week. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning and God bless.